it out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. This is Tom Fennell. I'm introducing Tom first this, this time. <laughs> I always introduce myself first. It's no yeah, but you were up there first. I got Aha, you up okay. there first. And I'm George Harvey. And every week, um, I, every day, I look, at the, I look at the news and I get my uh, uh, collection of news material, which I put at a blog called geoharvey.wordpress.com. You can visit it. It goes up every day and usually has 10 or 15 uh, uh, news items that are linked. And I have to go through about 250, 300, 350 news items every day in order to get those up. So I get a pretty good idea of what's going on. Not perfect, but pretty good. And um, Tom and I decided to put this show on just so people can hear the the items that I think are the most important of the previous week. And so he, we will start with last Thursday, which is January 8th. The, um, this from Argus Media, German power sector greenhouse gas emissions fell in 2014, hitting their second lowest level since 1990, according to a German think tank Agora Energiewende. The sector em emitted 301 million tons of CO2 last year, down from 317 million in 2013. The previous low was two 294 in two 2009. And of course, what happened here was after Fukushima, the, um, the uh, uh, Germans decided that they were going to close down their nuclear power plants as expeditiously as possible. So they closed eight out of 17 plants, and th the electricity had to be made up for with coal. And so their emissions went up. Now what, what do you have there, Tom? You well, this is, a, this is a graph going back to uh, 1980. Yeah. And it shows the electricity within Germany that's been generated from fossil fuels, and it has taken a very big nosedive in the last few years. Yeah, right. And there's something highlighted there, which is a, it's only a sentence, and I'll read it. Okay. It says, renewable energy sources comprise the largest share in Germany's gross power generation mix. Right. For the first time last year. Yeah. Leading to a sharp fall in generation from hard coal and gas-fired plants, which is just exactly right. what the graph is showing right. us. Right, right. So and Germany, once again, is leading the world, I think, in this kind yeah. of stuff. That although, energy vendor that they right. instituted is really doing a good job. It is, although they're being passed by Denmark. Denmark is starting to overtake Denmark is them. Actually over well, Denmark, has, has Denmark is really big in wind. It is indeed. And it, it is, uh, you know, the Danes are, are interested in pursuing this. They, I, I, I don't see how all those Danes with yachts can manage to maneuver between the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> between those, all those towers out there. Oh, between the towers. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is that the, the, the wind turbines are way, way, the blades are way up in the air. And they don't put them in shipping lanes. Hey, they're nowhere near Cape Cod, and there's people in Cape Cod that object to them. They haven't even been built yet. Yes, <laughs> and and you know, the, the, there is some concern that Cape Wind won't be built because the ca contracts they had were canceled. Although I don't think. Well, that, we we uh, I think we reported on that. Yeah, we but did. I don't think it's really going to happen. It's, you, they're, they're playing games back and forth. Here. I think they are. They're going to build that. Uh, there's too much money into it, and the money comes from other places besides Cape Wind and the and the. Oh power yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's, yeah. We will touch base on this a little bit later from a, an outfit in Erie, Pennsylvania. Well, oh, yes. no, they're in Cleveland. Are they? But okay. it's Lake Erie. It's Lake and Erie. And they're talking about, what is the word they use? It's the amount of uh, wind power in the United States. I don't is, know, but we will get to we'll it. We'll get to it. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> a lot of wind power. Um, the next item comes from the Jakarta Post. Fuel subsidies have been a constant issue for the Indonesian government, actually governments worldwide, for more than a decade. 
The growing consumption and the volatility of global oil prices have taken a toll on the state finances reaching $19.6 billion in 2014, roughly 15% of the state budget. Now the state is ending the subsidies. Well, the backstory is here for years and years and years, the government's been subsidizing gasoline. Yeah. And it's very popular among the people for yeah. obvious reasons, yeah. but uh, it's costing the government a lot of money. Right. And when they say here, there's a tendency to spend, for people to spend wastefully on things they can get cheap. Yes, that's true. <laughs> this behavior will fade out quickly after the subsidy is removed. So yeah. there's, there's, there's sense in what they're doing here. Right. There is indeed. And of course, we had uh, Tomas Fricke. Oh yeah, here, and he talked about about Indonesia and the subsidies that they had for kerosene for farmers. Okay, um, from the Morris Daily Herald, and I don't know where Morris is. It's someplace out west, or I uh, I looked at it. I don't think I checked. Uh, I don't think I checked. The Illinois yeah. government uh, agencies Wednesday uh, issued reports proposing ways to prop up Exelon's ailing nuclear power plants. The company says that at least three of the nuclear plants in the state could be closed for economic reasons and hopes to have nuclear plants included under a clean portfolio standard. And they are they're, looking... They're being kind of sneaky here. <laughs> <laughs> they want a subsidy is what it boils Absolutely. down to. And Absolutely. They're, they're being very bold about that. They're saying Absolutely. we need a subsidy or we're going to close these things down. And um, it's not just Illinois, it's also... Uh, New York, and they have uh, four plants that I know of. There are pr probably others that uh, you know they're losing money in in New York in, in one of these. I don't I forget whether it's New York or Illinois. They want to sell electricity for eighty five percent over wholesale. Yeah, well, nice if you can get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll read a, a, a quick paragraph here. Okay. Exelon has said that at least three of its nuclear plants in the state could be closed for economic reasons, as you just said. Yeah. The company has signaled to legislators that it would like to be included in some kind of clean portfolio standard yeah. under which it and solar and wind power producers are rewarded for providing energy to the state. Either that or the company will push for, for a price of carbon that could make its non-carbon emitting plants more competitive. There you go. <laughs> Last May, Exelon shrewdly turned his weakness. This is an interesting thing. This shows how these, these guys think. Yes. Shrewdly turns his weakness as a nuclear generator into a long-time strength. The strategy involved two nuclear plants in Illinois and a third in New Jersey. The three plants lost out on power contracts at an auction because Exelon bid them high and the plants were deemed too expensive. But these losses ultimately became a win for Exelon because the market was left with fewer plants to provide power, thus driving up prices for Exelon's remaining plants. There heads you go. I tail, heads I win, tails you lose. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But well, uh, you just, know, that's, is, you know, that's, that's it's, the game. It's a matter of, you know, there is such a thing as doing an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. And there is such <laughs> a thing as rigging the system. And that's what these guys are good at. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Friday, January 9th, from Clean Technica, we got this. Mercom Capital Group tallied $26.5 billion in solar project investment from corporate spending sources in 2014. That's an astounding 175% increase over 2013 when Mercom counted just $9.6 billion. So this, they went from 9.6 to 26.5. This is a very large solar plant. I don't know where it is, but it's it's in the developed world because you can see a lot of cars in the picture and railroad tracks. And, <coughs> but look at the size of it. It's big. <laughs> I'll grant you that. Okay. Um, So-called grid batteries. And this is something which I think is oh, really this is a good one. interesting. So-called grid batteries could lower the cost of renewable power by eliminating intermittency problems. Aquion Energy, a Pittsburgh-based startup that uh, makes one such battery, announced that its technology will allow a small electric grid in Hawaii to run around the clock on solar power. And that is at, in, from MIT Technology Review. They had another yeah, announcement yeah. about this today. We'll talk about this again later. Yeah. The announcement they had today, which we're not going to cover in this show, is uh, they put two of these batteries into a restaurant in Slovenia. 
where's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's where Vlasta comes from. Is it? No, she doesn't come. She comes from Slovakia. I think she comes from Slovenia. I think she comes well, from... Well, <laughs> we'll ask her. <laughs> they are different Slovakia, countries. Slovenia. Yeah, you say... You know, <laughs> I say potato. <laughs> well, take a look at that battery there. What's your first impression? It looks like a shoebox. It looks to me like a car battery. <laughs> it does, but it's big. But it's not. It's not. That that Here's a picture of it on a forklift truck. It's big. It's, it's well, it's four foot cube. And okay. it's 25 uh, kilowatts. 25 kilowatts. Kilowatt hours. I'm sorry. Oh, 25, 25 kilowatt, kilowatt hours. hours. Which means it would power an ordinary house for more than a day. Yeah, it's, it's, it's superb for uh, somebody who's self-generating with, with right. uh, solar and or wind. You put this thing in your basement and you never pay a power bill again. Yeah, and and th this and they're stackable. They're, they're, they're <laughs> they, they, this thing if is. Your basement is more than eight feet deep. You can put two of these on top of. Absolutely, it. <laughs> we'll see that later. There's there's a, there's a picture of a building with about a hundred of these in there. Oh my gosh! <laughs> well, this is when I said at one, a house for a day. I'm talking about an ordinary house that's on the grid and uses a lot of electricity. If, if the people I know who are, who live off grid are much more careful with their power. Oh yeah, and, and yeah. so twenty-five. Well, something like this, they don't have to be. Would they would go for <laughs> for days on this? Something but, like this, they don't have to be. <clears throat> these these batteries are getting cheap, and that is a that's a very big thing. And in fact, we're, I'm going to be writing an article on Aquion and a couple of other batteries for Green Energy Times, the well, February you, issue. You definitely better talk about Ambry. Ambry. I'll mention it. Okay. Because we talked about it already. I'm fascinated by this. Last month, Ambry, a startup based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is where MIT is located, yeah. by the way, that makes batteries out of molten metal. Oh yes, yes. We talked about. It. And now yeah. said it would connect its batteries to the grid for the first time later this year in a series of pilot projects in Massachusetts, New York, Hawaii, and Alaska. Interesting. I mean, this fascinates me. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm waiting to see your report so we can talk about it. Cause this, this, this is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a flow battery, but what's flowing is metal. <laughs> it's metal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is the world is full of very unusual things. Okay, the next item that we have comes from. And I just have to move my computer here. Comes from Global, Global Post. Post. With gas pump prices near their lowest levels in five years, greener, cleaner alternative fuels are taking a hit. Makers of biodiesel, a fuel made from vegetable oil or animal fats, are slashing prices and margins to stay in competitive, uh, to, to stay competitive with the price of diesel fuel, which is down about 20 percent from a year ago. And um, this is uh, hardly a surprise. You know, the biodiesel is is going to be affected by by well, the everything price. everything will be affected because oil is the benchmark. Oil is a benchmark in some ways, but when it comes to electrical power, it is not. It is not, right. And um, this is one of the things that I've seen a lot of the news recently is what's going to happen to renewables be with the price of oil so low. And the answer to that question is wind is not competing with oil. It is competing with coal and gas and nuclear, but not with oil. Um, solar, same thing. Same thing. It's, and it's so, bio-renewables that are going to get hit. Right. It's, and but, and uh, I don't know how badly they're going to be hit in the, in the long run. It's, uh, well, there's such a small fraction of the overall picture right. that some companies are going to wind up going out of business, some projects are going to wind up not getting started, the rest right. of, the, of everybody's going to ride this out, right. and when the prices go back up, they're going to be ready. Yes. And the prices will go back up. Yes, I agree. My m mouse is not working. Okay, I'll just use my little thing here. It does okay. mention here that using natural gas as a replacement for diesel and heavy-duty operations has also less appeal these days. This, that's been a trend, and it's going to go on, on a shelf for a couple of years. Yes. Over-the-road trucks running on uh, compressed natural gas. There we go. Now, will that work? And the answer is no, it won't. Okay. Meanwhile, and this is this we just mentioned this before the show started. Low oil prices have spurred sales of pickup trucks and large SUVs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> sales of these brands soared more than thirty percent in December. Uh, don't do it. If you've got <laughs> By the time you long before you got that thing paid for, the prices are gonna be up. Yes, they will be. And you can count on that. <laughs> um, and they may be up to 
higher pl uh, pl uh, prices than we've ever seen before. I, I expect that. They the probably case. will be. I mean, look, these guys have played this game before, and they're good at it. <laughs> they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. <laughs> yep. Okay, um, the next item from Saturday, January 10th. Researchers at Karl Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and DVGW have demonstrated that power from wind and solar can be stored in the form of methane efficiently made from biomass-based carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The demo SNG pilot plant constructed by the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology will operate in Sweden. This There's is a picture Fizz. of the demo plant. This is a, f a picture of the... The demo plant that they're talking about. Oh, the demo This is plant. their plant. Okay. It, it's, it's a container. It's It'll a fit container. on a truck. You can yeah. ship it anywhere. Yeah. And the, 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 one of the things that's interesting about this is the underlying technology behind this has been, has been known for over 100 years. Yes, yes. So the underlying technology is, is not the issue. Hey, you. <laughs> Nope, I'm going to say I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Sorry about that. I get I don't even think about turning that thing off because no, I get about one. Mine's on, but nobody knows. Yeah, I, I get it. a call every twenty years. You know, <laughs> this, this this thing. I've I've got over a thousand minutes, <laughs> and I get called during a TV show. Okay, <clears throat> the. All right, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, there we go. <laughs> throw, it, throw it down the road. <laughs> I, yeah, I think what I should do is get rid of it. <laughs> um, at any rate, let's just keep going. Pretend that it didn't happen. <laughs> well, the interesting thing about this, they, they can turn electricity yeah. into methane. Yes. Pump the methane right into the methane grid. Yeah. And it goes where it goes. Yes. So if they got a lot, uh, extra electricity from, say, wind or solar, they yep. make a little methane and pump that into the grid. Right. It's, it just adds, it's just another form of storage. Right. Um, the, the thing that has, has happened since the, this was invented over 100 years ago is that they've come up with more uh, efficient ways of doing the work. So this is not like it's somebody yeah, They've got it. some ni nice, neat new catalysts. That yeah, they've this. got neat new catalysts. Yeah. yeah. And and one of the big deals about things like that is that the old catalysts tend to be expensive. Expensive. Yeah. Vanadium and stuff like that. Yeah. Platinum. Platinum. That is, <laughs> platinum hasn't been used for this as far as I know, but yeah, vanadium is pretty expensive. Well, the takeaway on this is a sentence here. Methanation, which is what they're talking about, has the advantage that the infrastructure existing for the distribution and storage of natural gas and their standard appliances can be used further without any modifications or readjustment being required. They just pump it right in there. Right. It's a drop. Why an effective methanation wind and why an effective methanation, wind and solar power can be fed into the natural gas grid without any limitations. And it's not the only thing that can. B uh, Biogas uh, can, can be fed into the grid too, so that the biogas that's being produced in biodigesters today... Which is also methanation. It's also methanation. Yeah. It, it, you know, we've got a m multiple sources of methane. We've got, an, we've got, a, natural, uh, na an, we've got a grid of uh, natural gas. We can put this stuff into the grid. So this, again, I've said it before, and it's true. There's a lot of very bright guys there are. figuring about yeah. a lot of different things, yep. and some of these guys are going to hit the nail right on the head. Right. That came from phys.org, P-H-Y-S.org. Phys.org. Phys remember, remember that. Clean technology. This is an interesting one coming up. Okay. The first round-the-world flight powered entirely by solar energy has begun with the transportation of solar impulse to dis disassembled in the belly of a cargo lux Boeing 747 from from the Pern Aerodrome in Switzerland to the departure and final landing city of Abu Dhabi, according to the Solar uh, Impulse team. And there's a picture of Abu Dhabi up there. It looks yeah. quite impressive. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's a it's an interesting place. Is and I saw this picture. That, is that where they have that indoor ski slope? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Gosh. They got more money than they know what to do with. Yes, I think that's true. <laughs> 
I saw this picture and I read about it, you know, and, and I'm looking at that airplane in the picture. I said, that's not the plane. Yes. And then you just read about it. No, the plane's inside that plane. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and here's a picture of the plane. I got the, the I'll picture bring it of the plane is really look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's all solar panels. The the previous edition of this plane, yeah. which was also it had a wingspan yeah. bigger than the wing, wingspan of a seven forty seven. About twice as big. The previous edition of of this plane, which was gigantic in terms of its wingspan, weighed about as much as a heavy car. I can believe it. Looking at that, there's, <laughs> there's, there's not there's a lot of mass it. there. Yeah. It's made out of balsa wood. <laughs> you, 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 you put a couple of balloons on that thing and it would, it would stale off without any yeah, so, sun yeah, at all. Absolutely. It's still, a, it's still really rather fascinating. Though. It is rather fascinating. It's also not very fast. No. It's, <laughs> It's really not very practical either. No, it's not. <laughs> they carry a few letters to say they did it, you know, and get them postmarked. And, yes, uh, I suppose. Actually, but they're accomplishing something. Yeah, you know? they are. They're Around the world they're, flight. They're demonstrating something. We've talked about this before, and, and I thought it was around the world, but it was just a transatlantic. Now they're going big time. Yes. They're going to stay up there for a couple of weeks. Yes. They're not they're coming go, down. They're not coming down? <laughs> they're not landing? No. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so they got that, enough storage that, on cabin, board. Is this one person or two? Uh, probably two. I would have, wouldn't they're, imagine they're, it. If they, they, they're probably I, the heaviest objects. It's smelly in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not exerting a lot, you know. Yes, I suppose that's true. Okay. The next item is also from Clean Technic. In, in April, we reported that seismologists were hot on the trail of the smoking gun that would link fracking to earthquakes in Ohio. Uh, at the time, the experts were a bit cautious, but earlier this week, Seismological S S Society of America came out with a definitive statement. Yes, fracking earthquakes are real. And in some cases, they're actually getting big enough that they're noticeable. Yeah, Richter 3.0 is... Big, uh, big enough that they're bringing chimneys down. Yeah, they're, they're doing some damage. And yeah. uh, The same thing, by the way, happens with um, enhanced geothermal. Yes, it does. Well, it's, is, it's basically fracking. They like to say it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. There was a, there was a big, uh, big, I don't know, it was multi-million dollar geothermal plant that was closed in Switzerland because it was causing earthquakes yeah, yeah. several years ago. You, you can't play around with Mother Nature. No. There are second order consequences that are going to happen whether you, you like it or not. Do not <laughs> give Mother Nature imperial margarine. <laughs> it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. That's right. <laughs> okay. Sunday, January 11th from Clean Technica. We're getting a lot from Clean Technica. Noted campaigning organization Avaz. A-V-A-A-Z, for those who have never heard of it, which I think is probably going to be everybody, recently <laughs> sent a petition with signatures of 2.2 million people to the UN Secure as Secretary General. It asked all levels of government worldwide to transition to 100% renewable energy. Avaz is currently aim aiming at getting at least 100 cities around the world to jo join its campaign. And you know, when I read this article, I looked them up yeah. to find out. Yeah. They have... They were f founded eight years ago, and they have 42 million members. That's all right. That's <laughs> all right. There's, there's some people paying attention. People paying attention. Yeah. I don't know what they did to do that, but um, the Guardian said, that, I think it was the Guardian, said that they were the, the largest and most uh, influential online organization, uh, environmental organization in the world. And... I think that's what they said, but nevertheless, 42 million <laughs> s people joining in a, in a matter of, of eight years is just amazing. It is that. I'll, I mean, read, I'll read a quick paragraph here. Oh, okay, go ahead and do that. A renewables revolution is happening right now, and in just a few months, it's gone from a pipe dream to mainstream with countries including Norway and Uruguay flicking the clean switch and cities, such as you just mentioned, Frankfurt, Seattle, and Copenhagen doing the same. And it ends up, we hope, that cities and towns across Britain will follow the lead this year. Well, it's a British article. Yes. And that picture there is a, it's not a Photoshop, it's a real location in Cornwall, and there's turbines and panels in the same place. Right. 
Interesting. And Cornwall is that part of England where everybody talks like pirates. I'm sorry. <laughs> you go to Cornwall and you ask the people who live there, and yeah. they will tell you Cornwall is not part of England. <laughs> yeah, well, you, they're not English, they're Cornish. That's right. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, probably why they all talk like pirates. <laughs> Arr. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I have, I have known people from Cornwall, and they are interesting people. Okay. Uh, we talked about this guy before. Um, Rod, the Rochester Gas and Electric Corporation yep. has proposed a plan for e easing the Jinnah nuclear plant into retirement while lessening additional costs to clients. The proposal was part of proceedings to establish whether buyers could, should pay a premium for electricity from the aging plant which is losing money, and that is Exelon again. West Valley News, brother. It brother. is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. our friend. Our uh, friend. <laughs> I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, why the heck don't they just go out on the open market and buy more power? And there is an answer, unfortunately. They don't have the connection to the grid to permit them to buy enough power to replace this plant. Which so, means? So that's what they're doing right now. As a matter of fact, it may be over. I think today is the day they're today supposed to Today is the day decide. that they have to have their, their act together. And their choice way. is keep the plant running at a loss or build two new substations. Right. And we don't know which way they're going to go yet. Well, I th the sense that I have is that RG&E wants to build the substations and keep the plant going until the substations well, are, yeah, are in place. Yeah, th that's a likely, a likely so compromise. They're going so they're going to have a compromise. But certainly there is a compromise that they're trying to get. Okay, Imperial Valley News said this, California, a national leader in advancing energy storage, envisions this technology is a critical component in reducing global warming, improving air quality, and promoting en energy independence. The state currently has several pilot projects and is working toward commercialization of energy storage. Well, the article's clearly about California. Yeah. Well, it's really about energy storage. Yes. And they're saying, well, what they're saying is California is leading the way in energy storage. Well, it is. The we government's had, aware of it. Well, right. we talked about it. We talked, we've been talking about this yeah. for a while. There was a, there was a lithium ion battery that they're putting up in uh, San Diego, and it's 100 megawatts or something like that? Rather bigger than the one in your uh, cell phone. Probably. <laughs> and it'll probably, when it decides to tell you that the, somebody's calling, make more noise than this thing. <laughs> but yeah, what well, well, we've talked about Pat Brown a couple of times. Is Pat? No, Jerry Brown. We talked about the governor. Yes. We talked about Jerry Brown a couple yes. of times. He's yes. leading the way here. And, uh, well, Jerry Brown has always been in, interested in things like that, and I think that he's finally got to a point where he's saying, you see, I told you you should be doing this <laughs> long ago. Well, he's got a little bit of credibility now. He's got a few years under him. He's lost yep. a little bit of hair. and uh, Yep, looks a uh, little he's, bit older. He, he's starting to think a little bit, uh, maybe more clearly. Yes. <laughs> he doesn't look more like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but he's talking more like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Or maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger is talking more like him. I don't know. <laughs> okay. The uh, next item is from BBC News. Oh, this is an interesting one to me. This okay. is very interesting. This one, I think, is a, it's kind of, it's almost a showstopper. Every year, botanists in the UK look for flowers in bloom on New Year's Day. It's kind of a tradition. They've been doing it for decades. Even given uh, Britain's mild climate, it seems surprising that they usually find 20 or 30 f species flowering on New Year's Day yeah. in Britain. Now, I got to tell you. This, this year, New Year's Day has been particularly warm. Yeah. I lived in Kent, which is in the southeast corner of England, and I lived okay. in Devon, which is in the southwest corner, okay. with just Cornwall <laughs> to the west, which is not in England. <laughs> and I was amazed by what, what goes on in southern England. We had in our yard um, bamboo growing. I'm sure you had palm trees. There were, there were parks nearby that had palm trees yeah. growing in them. And in fact, there are native palm trees that grow in that area. In that area. Yeah, there's some in Ireland, too. Southern yeah. Ireland's got palm trees. Yep. And um, there are, believe it or not, there are native scorpions that live in Britain in the southern. In the southern oh, areas. really? Yeah. yeah. And they say that you can close down southern Britain with half an inch of snow because nobody knows what to do yeah. with it. Yeah. Now, it is chilly and people, you know, the house that I lived in in, in Devon, 
um, the temperature inside the house never got above 65 all summer. Wow. But nevertheless, you know, and 72 degrees did feel very warm. <laughs> the, the, um, this is, um, this is, you know, they go out and they find 20 or 30 species flowering. And as a matter of fact, I have found um, species flowering in New Hampshire on Christmas Day. So this is not a huge surprise to me. Okay. Okay. This year, they were stunned. They found flowers of 368 species flowering in Britain on New Year's Day. Well, here's a picture. I'll bring it up again. Yeah. This is a hill full of gorse. Now, gorse is a shrub. Yes. And at least in Ireland, and I've seen it, it's, it's a, it's up, it grows everywhere up on hills. Mm -hmm. And late April, early May, the hills look like this. Yeah. And by the way, that's impenetrable. You could not walk across that field. Yeah. That, that is such a thicket. Yes. Rabbits love it, but people don't. But uh, <laughs> this, this is New Year's Day. Yeah. This is four months early. Yeah. And of course, what, one, one of the things they mentioned <coughs> in the article is what happens if, in January and February if they get some really cold weather, well, all these flowers are going to die. But, uh, you know, they'll, 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 re they'll rebound. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. But that is pretty interesting. It's uh, our next art uh, article, I believe, is another article on batteries. It's the same company. Yeah. It's Aquion. And there was they had I told you they had one about Slovenia. Yes, yes, you did. But um, battery startup Aquion Energy made a deal with an off-grid residential estate in Hawaii to supply one megawatt hour aqueous battery, uh, aque aqueous hy hybrid ion battery. The battery will be combined with the Bakken Hale Estates 107. Bakken Hale, not Bakken Shale. No. <laughs> 176 kilowatt solar PV system to provide for almost all of its electrical use, allowing for a completely off grid setup. This makes good sense in a state where the electric prices, you know, the very high. Very oh, high. Absolutely. I think they're what? Absolutely. 37 cents per kilowatt hour yeah, or something. It's highest in America. Yeah. It's the highest it's in the U.S., yeah, with the exception of certain places that are not on the grid in Alaska and so forth. Well, there's a picture. Wow, of, that's not the same battery oh, we saw before. Well, it is, but it's about 100 of them. Oh, this is the 100 of them. <laughs> and they're all stacked. Side. Yeah. We, we saw this thing sitting on a forklift truck. Oh, those are people. Yeah, aren't they? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> if you look at each one of those cubes, that's, that's what was on the, the forklift truck. And they're stacked four high in piles about, well, four. There's about, a couple there, hundred There's about there. 12 of them in each stack. There's three, four stacks to a, to a row, and there's one, two, three... You can There's tell eight, this guy eight or was nine an stacks there. Yeah, you can tell this guy was an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Love to do things with numbers. But there's a lot of, well, that's an artist's rendition. Yes. But it shows what can be done with these batteries. Right. These, these things are almost infinitely expandable. Yes. Limited only by the ability of the plant to produce them. Yes. Which is mentioned here because they, uh, <laughs> they currently possess, possess the capacity to manufacture 200 megawatt hours of batteries. Now that stacks 24, 25 kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. So they can manufacture 200 megawatt hours in a year, mm -hmm. and they're trying to goose that up to a gigawatt hour in a year. Right. So yeah. they're onto something. They're yes. onto something. They yes. they got a good idea, <clears throat> not for everybody, but for a lot of people. For a lot of people. Okay. Either individually with one of those per house, or uh, with a hundred of them for a, a microgrid. Right. And that's exactly what this guy's doing out there in Hawaii. Right. He's got an island. He's got a microgrid on his island. Right. And where it makes perfect sense to do that. You don't have many choices in a place like that. You could hire somebody to keep a diesel running all night. But. <laughs> okay. The, the latest ultra mega, ultra mega. That's an interesting way of doing things. The latest ultra mega solar power project announced in India is in the state of Gujarat. The state that originated the concept of solar parks. It will also include wind energy installations. The new project announced under India's ultra mega solar power policy will provide five gigawatts of solar and wind combined. Now the picture up there is an existing plant. Yes. That's right now the biggest one in Asia. Tons. Yeah. 
We've seen this one, yeah. Yeah, a bunch of times. That, that just, just staggers me. Yeah. I think that's a superhighway in the middle of it. Is it? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't but, tell. I thought it was... It could know. be a railroad. It could be two railroad tracks. But yeah. look, I think it's a superhighway. And there's a backstory here. Yes. But this this uh, state in Gujarat is in the northern part of India. It's right. the flat land just before the Himalayas start. Right. And apparently it has been for many, many years, maybe centuries, a place where they produce salt. Yes. Okay, there's apparently, it used to be at one time, probably why it's flat, Yeah. a salt lake that's evaporated right. and it's salt. Yep. Well, after they take the salt off, what do they do with the land? It's flat desert, nothing's growing there, you can see. Right. So the owner of the ex-salt factory here, yep. he said, well, I'm going to put up solar. Yeah. Well, why don't you put up solar for me? I'll let you let you yeah. let you rent the land. Yep. And it's a great idea. They're doing these all over North India. They this is a this is a big push in India. They they are the amount of solar that they're trying to put in in India is mind-boggling. And just for the you know for so people know, uh, five gigawatts of solar is probably equal to, I'm going to say. One and a half or so Vermont Yankee nuclear power plants. I'd say two and a half, but two and a half. It's, it's a lot. It's a yeah, lot. Yeah, I keep thinking it's of nuclear a lot. power plants as being a gigawatt, but Vermont Yankee was about a two thirds. It's gigawatt. a lot. Okay, and this is <coughs> this is only part of what India is doing. We'll touch oh. upon it. This is the the large scale stuff. Yep, is going into the grid. Yep, and the small scale stuff is going into the villages. That's right. And we'll talk about we that very shortly. We will talk about that. Okay, next smart meters. <coughs> Excuse me. Market research from IHS projects, gr uh, growth in the global market for grid-connected residential PV solar installations with energy storage from the current 90 megawatts to over 900 megawatts in 2018. So they're projecting that growth. Are we Cost talk, reductions for are we storage. Talking about the same, <laughs> are we talking about the we, same one? No, we're not. Sun Edison. Well, I missed, I, I'm sorry, I saw the India thing on the Sun Edison and just charged ahead. Okay, let's <laughs> let's. Um, this one, this one is in India. Okay, so let me read the Sun Sun Edison one. In India, Sun Edison and OmniGrid Micropower. This is important. This is the good. This is the villages. Right. Uh, pri uh, OmniGrid Micropower com Company Private Limited announced that they have signed a framework agreement to develop five thousand solar projects representing two hundred and fifty megawatts of electricity. Throughout India over the next three to five years, the hope, they hope the deal will bring electric power to 10 million people. And these are all people living in little villages. Right. This is from Power Online. These are people who are living in places where they don't have They've any never electricity had electricity. At all. Yeah. And, you know, it's... it's um, well, many of them don't even know what it is. <laughs> well, no, I don't think that's true because they have <laughs> cell phones. Yeah, they get, which, which, <laughs> kind, which kind of is related to this. Yes, it is. They, I think, I think they know what electricity is. They want it, and they want it for reasons that a lot of people in the United States would regard as trivial. Yeah, they want to watch television. They want to watch television. <laughs> they want to be able to have their kids study under under light bulbs instead of kerosene lamps. They want to, they want to have a fan. Yeah. All right. I mean, things like we don't even think about stuff like this. That's right. This is everyday life for these. It people. would be, it would be trivial to anybody in the United States except anybody who has never had them. And now I can get to smart meters and what I was reading before, so I'll just hit <laughs> it again. Market research firm IHS projects growth in the global market for grid-connected residential PV solar installations with energy storage from the current 90 megawatts to over 900 megawatts in 2018. 10 to 1. Yep. Cost reductions for storage, such as lithium-ion batteries, are starting to help drive the installation of solar systems. Well, what, one of this that this article is, is talking about is pushing the combination yeah. of panels and storage. Right. And it's now become economically feasible. Right. And people are going to start doing it. And what's happening is, as the price of solar goes down, the, the, the um, battery... And the prices of batteries go down. Yeah, the batteries become more important. People are, yep. are getting more of them. The price of those goes down, which drives down, uh, which drives sales of solar which reduces the price because we're still in a marketplace where with the expanding uh, ability to deliver these things, a, an increase in demand means a decrease in prices. Correct. 
Yeah. And demand management is part of the system too, which we've talked about. Right. I don't know if we're going to talk about it in this one, but. Uh, yep. Now, okay. The next one comes from the Greenfield <laughs> Daily Reporter, which is not Greenfield, Massachusetts. It's Greenfield, Indiana. I looked at that and I said, wait, is there something wrong? That's not the reporter, <laughs> that's the recorder. Yeah. And then I saw the small print. It's uh, well, somewhere in Indiana. Yeah. The um, owner of the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant says the fuel has been removed from the reactor and placed in the spent fuel pool. The information was contained in a letter dated Friday from Energy Nuclear Operations to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And this means that Vermont Yankee is no longer on the list of reactors that is kept by the NRC. They have, you know, the daily reports they put yeah, out, yeah, has, yeah. It, they, it just isn't there anymore. Well, it's not running. It's not running, but more to the point, they are no longer licensed because when they removed that, they lost their license. Well, they did. So yeah. they can't turn around and say we changed our mind and well, start up they, again. Well, they wouldn't have been able to anyway because they would have required this, this, the permission of the state of Vermont. And yeah. I think that would they have They wouldn't been, have gotten it. They would not have got that. It would not have happened. Well, it was good while it lasted. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, some, um, there's some disagreement about that. <laughs> okay. Our next item comes from Clean Technica, and it was on Wednesday, January 14th. A recently released report... On the uh, from North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center suggests that in almost every one of America's 50 largest cities, a solar PV system of typical size offers a better rate of return than the stock market. Well, and that's for, interesting. Yeah, and for 42 of them, the cost of solar is already less than their local utility electricity. And that says something. Should I read that again just to make sure everybody knows? Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to. That's okay. <clears throat> One of the things it says here that, that the people are still thinking of, they're not thinking of solar power as anything other than investment, and they're saying, well, that's not for me. I don't have the money to invest. Yeah. And then they argue about, well, if you consider what you're paying to the power bill, power company for yeah. 20 years, yeah. none of that is recoverable. Yes. If you spend this the same amount of money that on you might spend for power over the next 20 years. Seven years. Well, yeah. You, yeah. You, if you spend the, power, the money if you, that you would send to the utility. For on, 20 years. No. You'll for, recover for seven it in seven. Years, <laughs> for seven years. <laughs> yeah. If you take seven okay. years worth of utility bills and you put that into solar, you will recover that amount in, in, in seven, seven years. years. Yeah. After that, then this it's, is the thing that makes it free. such a great and great investment. After that, your your utility bill has disappeared. You get well, from free some of the things we've talked about. You might be able to sell that extra power to the to the grid. Make money. in many cases that's the that is true. And the other thing too is is if you oversize oversize your system, you can go to a um, you can go to a, a, a system that includes enough electricity to run a heat pump, in which case you don't have to pay for fuel for, heat for heating your yep. house either. Yep. And by the time you're done with that in your new electric car, <laughs> you're, you're in a position where you can save a whole lot of money. Well, it's certainly possible, but, yeah. but some people got to change their thinking. This they is, this is no longer thinking. just an investment for the rich. It's not just for the rich. It's for, and th this, is the, this is the thing that people don't understand. And this has been true in Vermont for over a year now, for probably over two years now, the cheapest source of electricity that we've got as citizens in Vermont is solar power. Mm -hmm. And I will add to that, the cheapest source of power the utilities have is wind. Mm -hmm. And solar power over much of the United States is tied with natural gas, which is at its low price. Natural gas is going to go up. That's, that's not going to last. Solar is going to continue going down according mm -hmm. to the pro pro projections, which means that two years from now, you're, if you want to put in a natural gas plant or a nuclear plant or a coal burning plant, which I think people will not be doing at all, well, all these things you, take would years. Have to, you would have to do some serious justification of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, and there may be reasons that people will come up with why they say they want natural gas or nuclear. but. Um, it's going to take some serious justification to get to the point where 
um, where people will do that? I think you got to be, you got to realize Wall Street's aware of that. The, you know, the investment money isn't going to be as freely forthcoming for gas and nuclear plants right. as it was in the past. I think Wall Street has become aware of that mm -hmm. only in the last year or two. That's correct. Yeah, I'll buy that yeah. from some of the stuff that we've talked about. Right. Places and like Forbes uh, wouldn't wouldn't touch renewables with well, the, the with a ten foot is, pole. Forbes is still running articles saying, you know, it's been a mistake for us to get involved in this and that with renewables. Yeah. Now a lot of these are opinion pieces. Yeah. And they run a lot of opinion pieces. They run pieces from Mark Cooper who says that we've got 30 nuclear power plants in the United States that might have to close down because we don't, they're, they're, they're just too expensive to run. And um, he's, a, he's a professor at the, at the Vermont Law School. Oh and yeah, we've, we've, we've done articles on him. Yeah. He might be in one of these, I think, because he certainly mentioned it something I read. He's, he's mentioned it a yeah. lot. But you know, you get a, lo you get a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, opinion one way or the other. But what is happening, and this is very, very clear, is that the price of power purchase agreements tells you what the price of the power is. Okay. And we've been seeing two and a half cents per kilowatt hour as the average price of power These purchase agreements. These are wholesale prices now. Yeah, yeah. As the average price of, of power purchase agreements in 2013 um, for wind. And of course, in 2014, it was down from was there. Low, lower. there. There were agreements where, where wind power was sold for one and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Nuclear cannot compete with that. Mm -hmm. Natural gas cannot mm -hmm. compete with that, even on the short term. Mm -hmm. And on the long term, things are changing. And, you know, people don't realize it, but this intermittency thing that, that, that People talk about the, the the sun isn't always shining. True enough, well, the yeah. wind isn't always blowing. Yeah, true yeah. enough, but the nuclear plant isn't always running. True, yeah. and neither is the natural gas plant or the coal plant. And, and the, then there's always batteries. Yeah, and the and utilities flow flow batteries and pump storage and. Well, I, I've seen some of the most <laughs> fascinating graphs. If you have, if you have um, a system which is supported by natural by um, wind and solar okay okay there, there was a, a thing I think it came from Texas and it was in the in the news today it showed um, the the graph for the for the uh, demand which started out at midnight pretty low and it it, it dipped act mm -hmm. actually after midnight but then it, it grew throughout the day until sundown and then it continued to grow very slightly and then it came down again so the, the daytime uh, demand was uh, pretty big and the nighttime demand was not. And this particular graph showed power sources that came from offshore wind, onshore wind, and solar. And of course, when the peak of uh, demand was approaching, that was the peak time when solar output mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. there. It, it happened that just as solar dropped off, the offshore wind, wind <laughs> offshore wind picked up that yeah, peak yeah. and just as that dropped off onshore wind picked up to to take oh, everything okay. through so the night and see so a pretty flat yeah picture here you you add, you add in a, a few power sources like like biomass or biogas and and batteries and you know a, yeah. a few other things like that you can run a system like that 24/7 yep and the the fact that it's distributed power is not a problem. It's probably a benefit. Probably a benefit. And the fact that you're not spending money for fuel is not a problem. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the next item came from resilience. Analysis of the impact uh, U.S. tight oil has on global oil markets shows that only around one quarter of the drop in U.S. oil prices, uh, imports of 1.7 million barrels a day since 2005 to 6 can be explained by the tight oil boom. Let me, let oil, me just mention what tight oil is to okay, those who aren't okay. as well versed as we are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> tight oil is oil that's hard to get out of the ground, like yes. oil shale yep. and tar sands and stuff like yep. that. It's not Bad. you stick a straw down into <laughs> the earth and oil comes out there used to be you know there have been times in this in this planet where 
you would come to a place and find oil coming out of the ground naturally. Oh, that's true. I mean, it takes you know? Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And there are places they, they, like that in Texas. They've known it, known about it for years. They call it Zift. Zift. And it's tar. It's the tar that results after the oil leaches to the ground. It and it's something that was recorded by the ancient Greeks. It's not a nice word it's in Arabic, Zift. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound nice. Okay. Oil imports dropped by a million barrels a day before the tight oil boom even began. And so you can't explain the drop off by tight right. oil. That's right. But it has contributed to it. It has contributed, but not much. This is a very interesting article, by the way. It's loaded, loaded, loaded with graphs. There's one of them up there that shows for the past, well, since 1990, I believe, where the U.S. has been getting their oil and when it peaked and when it's fallen down. Interestingly enough, over that entire period, Canada has been the biggest source of oil in the United States. Really? Yeah. So and that's where our, where our imported, imported oil is coming from. For the most of, part, yeah. st almost, almost flat. Uh, recently, Russia has taken, not taken over, but they've become a big uh, supplier. Yeah. But that's fallen off. Yeah, I, I another think. One, another one here that faked me out, Virgin Islands. I didn't think that we got oil from the Virgin Islands, <laughs> and it, we don't. There, there was a big refinery there. The oil was coming from Venezuela. Oh. And so as far as uh, the customs was concerned, it was coming from the Virgin Islands, which are American-owned. There must have been a tax dodge going on well, somewhere. Well, yeah, it, it might have. I don't know. Maybe. But I, in I any know. case, Virgin Islands has closed. But uh, if you're in any way interested in following us up, this is a tremendous article. It's about 10 pages, all full of graphs. Look it up on George's Geo website. GeoHarvey.org. And click on it. You'll be busy for a week. Yeah, GeoHarvey.org. It's, it's a very comprehensive article. And this is January We We could 14th. talk about it for two days on this yeah. show, but we're not going Well, on. we could talk about the next one for two days, too. <laughs> I think we better start And the next one is on. actually the last one of the day. Um, the Lake Erie Energy Development Corporation. Oh yeah, we already talked about that. Recently wrote a piece highlighting the impressive potential for offshore wind development in the United States. The figure says the US has a projected 4,223 gigawatts worth of offshore wind generating potential with 50 gigawatts from the Ohio waters of Lake Erie alone. Now, what is 4,223 gigawatts of offshore wind power? How do, we, how do we explain to people what that means? I can't wrap my head around it. I mean, it's well, more than the United States uses. Far more. If you, if, if you want to wrap your head around that, the way I would do it is this. An average newish nuclear power plant, which would be about half again the size of Vermont Yankee, is about one gigawatt. One gigawatt, yep. And that has... And this is 4,000 of them. Yeah. This, well, not of them. This, <laughs> you got to figure the capacity factors in okay, this, Okay, yep, yep, uh, yep. The capacity factor for offshore wind, and this is recent because, because you know, the, the, the capacity factor of wind power has been driven up recently by changes in software that, the, and, and things like that that tell them how to orient the, the wind yeah, turbines yeah. and things like that. So the... Capacity factor for offshore wind is about 45%. Okay, that's a half. That's yeah, close. Yeah. Nuclear, it's about 90%. Yep. So uh, two gigawatts of offshore wind is worth about one gigawatt of nuclear. Yeah, okay. Now, when you have, it, when you have, have wind turbines all over the place, they support each other. So when one goes down, you're going to find another one picking up. This is the equivalent of about 2,100 modern nuclear power plants. We have in the United States today 100. 99. Okay. Nuclear uh, Vermont Yankee is no longer on the list. And the 100 nuclear power plants that we have provide us with a little bit less than 20% of our electricity. So we could get 100% of our electricity from 500 of those plants. Mm -hmm. This is 2100. Mm -hmm. It would supply us with our electricity. <laughs> it would supply us with our heat. It would supply us with our transportation. Transportation, And, too. you know, basically, uh, we're saying that we could probably get all of our energy needs, or close to them, um, provided by this. It's not what I would suggest, 
but we can certainly get a lot, and that is what I would suggest. I would suggest getting a lot of energy out of offshore wind, onshore wind too. But well, reading into this article, this Lake Erie Energy Development Corporation was founded just to, just to explore Lake Erie. And they said, holy cow, there's a lot here. <laughs> what about all of the other lakes? What about all of the freshwater in America? Yeah. And they've expanded now and written this thing about the world. Yeah. And one of the things they say here, they claim this, and it's probably accurate, Europe has at least 80 offshore products in operation or under construction. Compared right. to the U.S., where offshore wind development is in its infant stages. Well, it, honestly, I think it's kind of in its infant stages in Europe, too. It's not that old. Well, it's a toddler in Europe. Yeah, it's a toddler. It's yeah, I, I, would grant you, I would grant you the toddler. <laughs> One of the things that I was amazed by today, and of course we will have this in the, in the show next week, was a report from Germany saying that, I, that in 2014 they had more than doubled the amount of wind, offshore wind turbines that they had and the power that came from them in that one year. In one year. In one year. Yeah. Now this is, the th this is the clincher that is just astonishing about this. If you take the amount that they've got that they're drawing in power from, that is only about 45% of the total number of wind turbines they've already got they've already installed. Got out there. <laughs> and most of them they haven't even got the cables going to. Yeah. All they'd have to do is get the cables running and the rest of the infrastructure that supports them going, and they're going to have those things in place too. The wind turbines are already installed. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to get that done as fast as they possibly can because, as you know, an offshore wind turbine is not cheap. Somebody's put millions Somebody's and put millions of dollars they want to, in there. They want, they want to get return. their money back. Yeah, yeah. And that means that they want to have that thing generating returns as quickly as possible. So my guess is the, the offshore wind in Germany, which ha was increased by more than 100% last year, will increase by well over 100% this year. This year. And this is becoming a very big deal. And, you know, they're, they're already in a position where they've got uh, one nuclear power plant is going to shut down early because of competition from offshore wind. Yeah. They've got coal burning plants shutting down because yep. of competition yep. from offshore wind. The energy venda, which is the energy transition, is about to, to show its stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> if anybody's looking at that picture and saying, what the hell is that? <laughs> that gray thing there that sort of looks like a goose. Yeah. is a map of the city of Cleveland. Oh, okay. And that thing sticking out that looks like the goose's neck is a breakwater. Is no, it's it's well, it doesn't even exist, but it's that's oh. there's going to be six turbines <coughs> out where that beak is. Oh, I see. And the rest of it is the transmission line, which I'm sure will be underwater. Yeah. And this is the pilot plant. They call it the uh, icebreaker. The icebreaker. Yeah, and this there's is this one. is scheduled to go into production. In the very near future. Yep. And this is a pilot plant. Yep. And this is only one little small part of Lake Erie. And all they're <laughs> looking at here is fresh water. Yeah. I mean, the ocean on you both know, sides it's funny. is vast. It's funny. There, uh, there's a woman in, in Vermont named Annette Smith who is profoundly anti-wind. She has a... She oh. has a I think I, I think you know you talked word. about her. You well, talked you, against you, her. You, you saw her. Yes, it's <laughs> yeah. right. I talked next to her. Next to her. I didn't. I didn't say much against her, but um, she she is profoundly anti-wind, and she has a has a an organization that she is in charge of. That she's and one day, as a kind of a gag, she put up a a photoshopped image of wind turbines on Lake Champlain. Okay. You know, and I think her I think her goal there was to show that how how horrible it would be to have wind turbines on Lake Champlain. And I looked at that and said, "Wow. What a great idea." <laughs> so Yeah, but the thing is you don't own a yacht. <laughs> I don't own a yacht. If I if I owned a yacht, I'd still favor wind turbines on Lake Champlain. I might put not put my yacht on the Lake Champlain. Well, another glorious hour is coming to an end. It sure is. What do we got to say about in the last minute and a half or two? Well, we don't have to say anything in the last <laughs> minute and a half or two. Um, we're actually we're actually about thirty seconds off from the end, and Roland's going to have to 
put something in. I think what we should do is just say goodbye. I goodbye. We'll do that. See you again. Goodbye, everybody. Bye bye. We spin and we turn. We work all day. Sewing and reaping, we store goods away. So we can be dressed well on the day that we die.